that was TEDx for all of you. Okay, moving on, on the same note, if I would have asked you, as I did, if I would have asked you one reason that you came out from your house to this place today would definitely be because of our amazing speakers. We have a great lineup of speakers. So I, I will not trouble you anymore. I will not keep you away from your speakers. We will quickly go ahead with the speaker number one. And I will take this opportunity to introduce our very first speaker of the event, Mr. Major General Mani, sir. Major General Mani, sir, was in charge of setting up the ITC infrastructure in India's eight, eight northeastern states. In addition, sir served as the Army Commander of Eastern Command Cyber Security and Electronic Warfare Advisor. As the head of the department, IT infrastructure and services at the College of Defense Management, he was directly involved in the hands-on deployment of a native campus-wide network. He oversaw around 400 personnel and resources while serving as the commanding officer of an electronic warfare unit in Jammu for nearly four years. In 1994, SIR has created a decision support system in C++ for counter-insurgency operations at the junior level. His current responsibilities is to oversee the creation of anti-drone technologies and systems, which calls for a multidisciplinary set of skills in digital signal processing, spread spectrum systems, uh, antenna design, and quality assurance. Mr. Money serves as the link between user needs and available technologies to deliver a high quality product to a wide range of customers, including the Indian Defense Forces, Police, CSIS, Security Forces of Central Asian Republic. With a huge round of applause, everyone, please let me welcome our first speaker for the day, Mr. Major General Mani, sir, going to talk about technology and warfare. Before I hand over the stage to our speaker, I would request all the attendees to kindly put your noise-making devices on silent mode. We would not expect any kind of disturbances. Can I have the presentation? Yeah, morning everyone. What I'm going to speak of is technology and warfare. It may seem somewhat incongruous to the theme of infinity and innovation, uh, but please bear with me. Then, yeah, okay. You see the evolution of warfare. It has been intimately connected with how technology has evolved. That's because technology impacts economic activities. You start with the industrial age. Before that, we had the agricultural age, where you had metals. It was a metal age, and we had implements made from, uh, from metals, like plows. And we had animals who were domesticated for use, some of them we used for carting the farm produce. It was an industrial, it was, an, uh, uh, it was like a, it was an agricultural society, and it, it was part of the river valley civilization. So when, it, when the time came for war, what people did was the same metal which was used to make plows was also made into swords and spears. The same animals which were used for carting the farm produce were also actually used, and now they were used as chariots. And in India's case, also we had elephants who did the job for us. And at this time, the target was who? The people. So it was a mass on mass kind of an attack. Sometime in the 12th century, there was an innovation called the stirrup. I don't know if you know what a stirrup is. A stirrup is something which comes on a horse. This small innovation enabled Genghis Khan to sweep across Central Asia because his soldiers had both his hands free and they could use their arms, both the arms easily, and they could use the swords while, you know, while riding and galloping across. So this small invention changed the way the battles were fought. Then we come to the industrial society. Isaac Newton. He laid the foundations for the Industrial Revolution. His equations of motion, we all know, they created machines. And these machines, what did they do? They did the job which hundreds of people could not do 
uh, one machine could do it. All the handloom workers in India went out of a job because we had textile industries coming up in Lancaster. This is what a machine could do. And when it came to war, World War I was the first example. We had machine guns, trenches, barbed wire, and lines which barely moved. But again, the side which did well was the side which had a better technology. That technology was poison gas. Now, fast forward to World War II. By this time, the electromagnetic spectrum had been harnessed. Marconi had done the transatl transatlantic wireless communications. So using radio and tanks, the entire battlefield scenario changed. We had the German army sweeping across Europe. They smashed the defenses of France and they reached the shores of the English Channel. Since they couldn't cross the channel, the Battle of Britain followed, which was using aircraft. Again, we had Wilbur Wright, we did it in 1903, but it saw fruition in World War II. And the Battle of Britain was fought for almost 400 days. And the skies were full of the fighters between the RAF and the Luftwaffe. And now you have, but how did the war end? What ended because of someone who came along, Einstein. Einstein said, okay, Newton's laws work. They work only in certain conditions. When you go to the atomic scale, what happens is Newton's laws, they fail. At that point, the only thing which is constant is not mass, but it's the speed of light. So with this, he had opened up a portal to an entirely new paradigm that was quantum physics. He opened it, he didn't enter inside, and who entered inside was Oppenheimer, Heisenberg. Heisenberg for the Nazis, Oppenheimer was for the Americans. And we all know who won. Oppenheimer won. He was tormented by guilt later on, but the Nazis lost. And that is what the nuclear weapon, the power of the nuclear weapon achieved. Hiroshima, Nagasaki was bombed, and Japan, was, which was unwilling to surrender, they surrendered there. But during World War II, an even more significant event happened. The Germans had an unbreakable code. They used a machine called the Enigma machine for it. The Enigma machine was something which could generate codes with a key which had a quintillion or a billion billion combinations. So this particular code of the key was changed at midnight every night. So what did you have? We just had 24 hours to break the code. So Alan Turing was called. He was a mathematician from Cambridge. He was called, they said, do something about it. And he realized that even if all the cryptographers of Britain got in, he got them together and said, break this code. In 24 hours, it was impossible to break the code because of the number of combinations which were there. So he said, only a machine can defeat another machine. And he created a machine, he called it Charlie, after his best friend, and that machine did the job. And that machine is what we know today as the computer. So that set the foundation for the next big thing. The computing revolution had started. A few decades later, we had satellite communications, and satellite communications, extended telecommunications everywhere. And that's when computing and communications converged. So what did we have? We had the information revolution. Today, we are in deep in the middle of information revolution. And why is it a revolution? It's a revolution because the industrial age amplified human muscle power. What 786 horses could do, one car can do, 786 BHP means that. 786 horses can do the same job. This is muscle power, amplifying your muscle. The information revolution, because it amplified the human mind. Now, the mind was amplified. What all the cryptographers of Britain could not do, one single machine could do. And this is what we are seeing today in the Russia-Ukraine war also. It is information uh, revolution completely at play. We have unmanned sensors 
who are looking at the battlefield 24-7. They're picking up stuff. And these are all the stuff that you people have been learning about. The Internet of Things, the unmapped sensors pick it up. Or using the Internet of Things, the data is transmitted. And once the data is transmitted, it reaches a central repository. Big data analytics processes it. Artificial intelligence looks for patterns within it. And when you see the patterns and you discern the, uh, the adversary's intentions, and that is when the army commanders on the field, they respond to a situation. So all this is happening in the Russia-Ukraine war. Now the race is actually between artificial intelligence of both the sides. Who has got the better, faster artificial intelligence program? So all the, all the studies that you people have been doing, all, it's all got a lot of value. Now we come to the real question. Where will technology take us? And this is part of the theme that we have been looking at. Where will it end? You know, nuclear weapons are supposed to end war. That's why Oppenheimer feared it so much. He, he, he never espoused the hydrogen bomb, although he created the fission bomb. The hydrogen bomb, he said, no, I'm not going to espouse it, because he was worried about the kind of casualties that will take place, the kind of people who will die. And he was tormented with guilt all his life. And, but it did not end war. Closer home, when we exploded our nuclear device in 1998, we said, OK, war is not an option anymore. So let us focus on economic development. Our friendly Western neighbor exploded another device a few days later. And he said, yeah, war is not an option. So let me do Kargil. And yesterday was Kargil Vijay Devas, by the way. So if you look at that, even nuclear weapons failed. Both of us are nuclear powers, we still went to war. So can technology help in ending war? Any sane person will ask this question. If you see from 3500 BCE, by some estimates, there have been only 300 years of peace. All of you are millennium born, I know, after 2000. So there's not been a single day of peace in the 21st century. There's been some war being fought somewhere on the planet even today, it's going on. The Russia-Ukraine war I spoke of is now 17, 18 months down the line. There's no more progress, but human lives are being lost. So can we end war? Can technology end war? Yeah, I think artificial intelligence has got a chance to end war. But it depends on who is programming it. If Hitler is going to program it, then you know what's going to happen. But if Gandhi were to do the same job, since I said artificial intelligence is enabling you to take decisions. Now, if you replace all the world leaders with Gandhi, does world peace have a chance? I think so. Because if Gandhi, what he said? He said, there is enough on earth for man's need, but not for his greed. Greed is a root cause. If today there's flooding, we just barely managed to reach the auditorium because of floods en route. There's flooding in Hyderabad, flooding in India, wildfires in Canada, and we have heat wave in Europe. Never had it. And all this is because of greed. So if I look at it, artificial intelligence programs need equations. So this is an equation which, if I had to translate Gandhi's thought on peace, I would put it in this form of this equation. The ultimate human goal is happiness. And if you put it as an equation, the desires entertained, which are at the end, bottom line, uh, at below in the denominator. And we have desires attained, which is whatever you get, whatever you achieve. Presently, artificial intelligence of Amazon, Google, 
and uh, Facebook, they all want you to buy stuff. You think, uh, think of a thing and the ad pops up in your feed. Go buy it. At this rate, what's going to happen is all that I said, catastrophe. Because there is no resources left. There's no planet B, there's only planet A, that is Earth. So if you have put this program, that desires entertained should come to zero. That's what Patanjali said. That's what Buddha said. If it tends to zero, as engineers, we all know, when the denominator tends to zero, what happens to the quotient? The quotient tends to infinity. So this is a blueprint available to us. Religions have promised this. They promise infinite bliss, but after death. For that first year to die, then paradise, and you have that. But on earth, if you want bliss, you want happiness, this is the way to go. Try to reduce your desires. And if you can program yourself and your computers this way, and where's the problem? The problem is in the human brain. Our human brain has got three layers. It's got a reptilian layer. It's got a mammalian layer. It's got a logical layer, the human layer. What is predominating is the reptilian layer. The reptilian layer is fight or flight. That's what makes you fight. Mammalian layer gives you love, nurture, peace. The human layer is logical. So what we need is a program which can erase the reptilian layer of the human mind if you really want world peace. With that, uh, I end my talk. And I hope the younger generation sitting here today, our generation failed. I hope you guys rise up to the task and ensure peace for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. May I now request our principal, Rajesh, sir, and Rohan, sir, to kindly felicitate our speaker. Thank you, sir. On the same note, okay. We are fortunate to have you as our chief mentor of Hitam, sir. Thank you so much.